If you could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. We need to eat a lot more of these. And so they convinced us that human health depends on foods we didn't eat for more than 99% of our entire existence. How did this happen? In the 1950s, a biochemist named Ansel Keys published a study that compared heart disease and fat consumption in a half dozen countries. The more fat, the more heart disease. The trend line was unmistakable. Just one little problem. Keys left out countries where people eat a lot of fat but have very little heart disease, like Holland and Norway. He also left out countries where people don't eat much fat but do have a lot of heart disease, like Chile. In fact, Keyes had reliable data from 22 countries and the results were all over the place. But you can't make a big splash in the scientific community with a trend line that looks like this. So Keyes did what any dedicated researcher would do. He threw out the data that didn't fit and published his results. His punishment for this bit of scientific chicanery was to get his picture on the cover of Time magazine. Keyes became known as the father of the lipid hypothesis, which says that eating saturated fat raises the cholesterol in your blood, and high cholesterol in your blood clogs your arteries and causes heart disease. The hypothesis that when you eat high fat, that then that produces high cholesterol, and the cholesterol produces heart disease, is wrong in every one of those links. This whole idea that dietary fat causes cholesterol problems it's sort of a myth. The whole idea that uh, cholesterol problems lead to heart disease is a myth. The theory is completely and totally wrong. It was uh, a theory that was made out of whole cloth and then pushed. The, the term artery clogging saturated fat, it's as though it's all one word. It's become part of the the zeitgeist, everybody knows saturated fat is bad for you, but when you get back and you start looking at the medical literature and you root back through to find out where this whole idea came from, it's bogus. Three authors who did root through the medical literature are science writer Gary Taubes, Swedish doctor Ufi Ravenskov, and British doctor Malcolm Kendrick. When they examined the data from all the big studies on heart disease, they discovered some pretty interesting facts. Here's my favorite. Guess how many studies actually prove that a high-fat diet causes heart disease? The answer? Zero. That's right. None. In some of the largest studies ever conducted, researchers put thousands of volunteers on a low-fat diet and then tracked their health history for several years. The results? Nothing. They had just as many heart attacks as people who weren't on a low-fat diet. Since 1948, the Harvard Medical School has been following the diets and death rates of the entire population of Framingham, Massachusetts. One of the researchers involved in the Framingham study called the lipid hypothesis the greatest scientific scam of this century, perhaps of any century. And after more than 40 years, even the director of the study made a rather startling admission about what the study data actually shows. The more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the lower the person's serum cholesterol. In other words, a high-fat diet does not automatically raise your cholesterol. Well, what about the second half of the lipid hypothesis? Whether it comes from your diet or not, doesn't high cholesterol cause heart disease? After all, that's what the experts have been telling us for 50 years. Lots of people have bad heart attacks and have low cholesterol. There's not really a huge correlation there. You've got people who have heart attacks and who develop plaque who have high cholesterol, people who have low cholesterol. There's really not any correlation. Michael DeBakey, the famous heart surgeon, compared the medical records of more than 1,700 of his own patients. He found no relationship between cholesterol levels and heart disease. When Dwight Eisenhower had his first heart attack, his cholesterol was only about 165. Wow, that's a nice healthy level there, General. 
So if high cholesterol doesn't actually cause heart disease, what does? The newest theories in heart disease development don't have anything to do with cholesterol. They have to do with inflammation. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Cholesterol is the thing that heart disease acts upon. The, the heart disease is the inflammation and the oxidation. The placking out of cholesterol once it becomes uh, oxidized. So many people have been found that have low uh, normal or low cholesterol and they still have bad heart disease. But uh, most of those people, when, when they're checked carefully, will have signs of, of inflammation. To understand how inflammation can cause heart disease, let's look at what cholesterol actually does. Cholesterol is one of the most important substances in your body. Without it, you'd be dead. Your brain and your nervous system are full of cholesterol. The walls of your cells depend on cholesterol. Nearly all of your hormones are made from cholesterol. This stuff is so important, almost every cell in your body can make its own cholesterol if it has to. The heart disease story we all know goes like this. If you have too much LDL or bad cholesterol, it builds up in your arteries and makes them narrow. But if you're lucky, HDL, or good cholesterol, gobbles it up and clears it away. It's a nice, simple story. And it's a load of baloney. For one thing, LDL and HDL are not cholesterol. They're proteins that carry cholesterol through your blood. LDL carries cholesterol from your liver to your tissues, and HDL carries old cholesterol back to your liver where it's recycled. If you want more HDL, the last thing you need is a low-fat diet. What makes HDL go up? Fat in the diet. That's what raises HDL. So you increase the fat in your diet, and your HDL, deemed by even the most fervent anti-cholesterol person as the good cholesterol, HDL goes up. That's right. In spite of what the experts told us, 27 different studies have shown that eating saturated fat raises your HDL. And despite its bad reputation, not all LDL is actually bad. LDL comes in different sized packages. They're little small, dense, BB-like packages, and they're big, round, fluffy, cotton ball-like packages. And the small, dense ones, it turns out, what's called a type B uh, LDL, are the most harmful ones. And the big, fluffy ones aren't particularly harmful at all. Heart disease doesn't begin when your cholesterol goes up. It begins when your arteries become damaged or inflamed. LDL then does exactly what it's supposed to do. It brings in cholesterol to help the healing process. But if small LDL becomes damaged by oxidation, it can penetrate the wall of the artery. If the inflammation and oxidation continue, a plaque begins to form. Now you've got heart disease. So does a high-fat diet produce too much small LDL? Nope. Small LDL is the result of eating too many carbohydrates. That's been shown in the medical literature probably a dozen times at least in papers that reducing carbohydrate in the diet shifts from a small dense pattern to a big fluffy pattern. Having an LDL that's 120 or 130 or 100 or 145 doesn't matter as much as the kind of LDL that it is. If the numbers alone don't mean very much, then why does high cholesterol get all the blame? Research consistently shows that smoking, elevated blood sugar, and emotional stress can cause inflammation, damage your arteries, and lead to heart disease. They also happen to raise your cholesterol. So by blaming cholesterol for causing heart disease, the experts relied on logic that makes about as much sense as this. In high crime areas, there are more calls to the police. Therefore, we can assume that calling the police produces an increase in crime. To get rid of crime, the answer is simple. Stop calling the police. But in spite of all the evidence that cholesterol is just an innocent bystander, the experts keep trying to bring it up on charges. In 1988, the Surgeon General's office set out to prove the lipid hypothesis by reviewing the data from all the major studies. But after 11 years and more than $100 million, the results were not supporting the theory. So they did what any dedicated government researchers would do. They shut down the entire project, saying it was becoming too complicated. And as Kendrick Taubes and Ravenskov discovered, that's been a disturbingly common pattern. 
researchers routinely ignore evidence that the lipid hypothesis is wrong and sometimes even manipulate their data for the sole purpose of supporting it. What could possibly cause such rampant dishonesty? In the 1970s, the lipid hypothesis was still very much in dispute. Then a Senate committee headed by George McGovern decided to settle the issue. McGovern at the time was following the Pritikin diet and believed everyone should be cutting back on fat and cholesterol. The committee's original report urged Americans to reduce their risk of heart attacks by reducing their intake of cholesterol, down to the equivalent of about one egg a day. But doctors took issue with that at the hearing, saying that eight studies involving 5,000 patients fail to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. Hmm, let's listen to that part again. Eight studies involving 5,000 patients fail to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. I have pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. You know, there were eminent scientists of the time saying, this is nonsense, there is no good scientific evidence that either fat or cholesterol, you know, is at the root of heart disease. I said to the professor that I was working with, you know, this is not right. Animal fat's not causing this, and this is not what the data says. So the McGovern staff did what any dedicated staff working for McGovern would do. They decided those scientists must have been paid off by the big bad dairy and egg industries. Well, I, I would only argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does of waiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. They went to great lengths to overlook anything that did not fall into lockstep with fat belief and basically just unleashed what amounted to a, a several decade long experiment in which all of us were unwitting participants. The McGovern Committee's report was written by a young staff member who happened to be a vegetarian and had no background in medicine or health research. The committee recommended a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet for everyone and offered some ideas that could only spring from the mind of a politician. But Senator Schweiker of Pennsylvania suggested that instead of discrediting the committee's report, the egg men should be out developing hens that would lay low-cholesterol eggs. Soon after the McGovern report was issued, the USDA got into the act. Carol Tucker Foreman, the assistant secretary at the time, believed in the low-fat diet theory and wanted to issue official guidelines to tell everybody how to eat. To make sure she was on solid scientific ground, she consulted with Philip Handler, the head of the National Academy of Sciences. Just one little problem. Handler told her the McGovern Committee's report was nonsense. So she did what any dedicated government official would do. She ignored him, shopped around for a scientist who agreed with her, then issued the guidelines. Thanks to a handful of politicians with no background in science, the heart-healthy benefits of a low-fat diet became official government policy. And real scientists got the message loud and clear. Tell us what we already believe or you can say goodbye to your lucrative government funding. There is influence that goes on, starting with the USDA, which is promoting commodity agriculture. So there is a lot of economic pressure on the people at NIH, on the people in the universities who carry out the studies for NIH. They live by their grants. No grants, no work, no job. Dr. Kilmer McCulley, a researcher at Harvard, went against the prevailing theory and published a study concluding that something other than cholesterol was causing heart disease. His reward for this bit of scientific integrity was to be denied tenure, lose all his research grants, and get shoved into a little laboratory in the basement. In academia, that's a polite way of saying, you're fired. He also ended up on an unofficial blacklist, and it took him two years to find another job as a researcher. A lot of people have built careers on this, and it's, uh, these are careers built on a very shaky factual foundation. There's a reasonable... Um, reason to believe that from the beginning, but to persist in the face of so much overwhelming evidence really can't be based on science and you have to, you have to think that there were other factors involved. Uh, it became uh, an industry. 
In the 1980s, the National Cholesterol Education Program released new guidelines that said everyone's cholesterol should be below 200, which was about 20 points below normal. And here's a strange coincidence. Most of the scientists who wrote those guidelines just happen to have a financial relationship with the companies that make cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins. Many of the studies that claimed a low-fat diet is good for your heart were funded by the American Heart Association, which earns millions of dollars licensing its heart check logo to healthy low-fat foods like Cocoa Puffs. If the lipid hypothesis ever goes away, that logo just became worthless. Give this another uh, decade and that hypothesis will be on the junk pile of history because it's not true. Okay, so maybe the lipid hypothesis isn't true. So what? What could possibly be wrong with cutting back on saturated fat and getting your cholesterol as low as possible? We now have this terrible phobia of fat, of animal fat, which the body needs to be normal, to be healthy. Your immune system is fat dependent. I mean, your brain is fat dependent. Your skin, your hair, your nails, all these things are fat dependent. Your, your sex hormones are fat dependent, are cholesterol dependent. They're made sort of on a cholesterol molecule. If you are elderly over the age of 60, and if you're a woman of any age, the cholesterol is a complete non issue. In fact, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. And this is, shows up in study after study. And yet, in spite of those studies, drugs that lower cholesterol are being marketed to women. But take a good look at that little disclaimer. If it doesn't prevent heart disease, why on earth would you take such a powerful drug? There is absolutely no benefit for women of any age in taking statins. I mean, statins are a waste of money for women. There's some real problems with taking statins. Memory loss, muscle problems, and osteoporosis in women. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that you wouldn't want to take statin drugs. And low cholesterol is a predictor for depression, suicide, violent behavior, strokes, and cancer. It's much better to have high cholesterol than lower cholesterol.